Welcome to our Wednesday night study, May 20th, 2020, at Christian Family Church of Santa Maria, California. If you'd like to get on our website, you can find any of our sermons by going to the top page and clicking Go to Our Sermons in order to get on our website. You can push www.cfcsm.org. Before we start tonight, we're going to be in Acts chapter 19, if you'll get your Bibles ready, Acts chapter 19, and we're going to start with verse 27, and before we do, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and as we study Paul, the Apostle Paul tonight, and the disciples leaving Ephesus and going on preaching in other cities, Lord, you said that those things that were written before time were written for our learning so that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. So, Lord, it applies to us here today, and I thank you for your word. I pray you will speak to us. Holy Spirit, you will teach us, and I pray that not only our ears will hear, but our hearts will understand and will obey. And we thank you for your word, Father. Bless us now as we study in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts chapter 19, starting with verse 27, we're going to go through verse 41. So that not only this craft is in danger to be set at naught, but it's also that the temple of the great goddess Diana would be despised and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world Worships. Now, Paul was in Ephesus, and he preached the gospel, and there were certain people there who received the Lord. One, Demetrius, who was a silversmith, who made silver shrines for Diana, and he brought a large amount for the craftsmen. And uh, he called them together and said, this preaching has caused people to quit buying our idols. So that we pick up that story in verse 27, his speech. He's saying, and when they heard these things, they were full of wrath. You know, when you touch people in their wallet, it upsets them. And that's exactly what's happening here. They were full of wrath and they cried out saying, great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusion. And having caught Gaius, And Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. And when Paul would have entered into the people, the disciples would not allow him to go in. Verse 31. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not adventure himself into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused. And the more part knew not why they even came together. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude. The Jews put him forward. And Alexander beckoned with his hand that he would have made his defense unto the people. But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice, for the space of two hours, they cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, You men of Ephesus, what man is there that knows not how that the city of Ephesus is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana, and of the image which fell down from Jupiter? Seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, you should be quiet and do nothing rashly. Verse 37. You have brought here these men, which are neither robbers of churches, nor blasphemies of your goddess. Wherefore, if Demetrius and the craftsmen that are with him have a matter against any man, the law is open, there are deputies, let them implead one another. But if you inquire anything concerning other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. For we are in danger to be called in question for this day's uproar there being no cause whereby we may give an account of this concourse. In other words, you don't even know why you're here. You've been screaming for two hours. We're going to be called in question for this. And verse 41, And when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. 
there's a lot here that doesn't meet the eye, but it'll definitely meet the heart. So we go back to verses 27 and 28. Now, again, Paul has led certain people in Ephesus to Christ, and they've quit uh, selling idols and doing the other things that they were doing, and it upset their, their trade. It upset their, their money that they were bringing in. So Demetrius twists the truth, and the people believe the lie. And you know, uh, in World War II, there was a man named Joseph Goebbels, and Joseph Goebbels was Hitler's propaganda minister. And one of the things he said, and it's also in Hitler's book called Mein Kampf, one of the things that they both said is, if you tell a lie, tell a big lie. And tell it often, and if you tell it often enough, the people will believe it. And so this very same thing was happening here with Demetrius. He spoke this outrageous lie against the apostles, and the whole city came together in the theater uh, and believed the lie. So let's take a look at Exodus chapter 23. In the book of Exodus, the 23rd chapter, and we want to look at verses 1 and 2. These are the laws of justice that were given to Moses. And verse 1 says in Exodus 23 and verse 1, Thou shalt not raise a false report. Do not put your hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Neither shall you speak in a cause to decline after many to wrestle in judgment. In other words, don't deceive people so that you'll cause many people to go astray. Does that sound familiar at all? Let's turn to John chapter 8, and let's see what the Lord Jesus had to say to the Pharisees who had just called him a devil. So in John chapter 8, in verse 41, the Lord Jesus talks to the Pharisees. And he tells them, you do the deeds of your father. And they said to him, well, we're not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Verse 42, Jesus said to them, well, if God were your father, you would love me. Because I proceeded forth and came from God, neither did I come by myself, but he sent me. Why then don't you understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. Because you are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. I want you to think about something, church, just for a minute. The Bible tells us very plainly all throughout Scripture, in Exodus chapter 20 especially, thou shalt not kill. Now that word kill means murder, and a lot of people take that out of context. It's wrong to go hunting, it's wrong. No. The scripture says, thou shalt not murder. So what is it about people that have no problem ripping a little infant out of the womb and aborting it, which is murder? Psalm 139 makes it very clear that from conception, that's a human being. And now they've even passed laws that you can debate with the doctor, the mother and the doctor, to see after the baby's born, if it has certain deformities, you can make a decision to kill the baby. It's called murder. It's murder. And Jesus said, if your father is the devil, then the evil things that your father does, you will do also. So then we look at that and we say, well, if they're murdering, then it's obvious from Scripture their father is the devil. And that's what Jesus said. He was a murderer from the beginning, did not abide in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Verse 45, Now because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Verse 46, Jesus said, which of you convinces me of sin? And if I'm saying the truth, why don't you believe me? In verse 47, Jesus makes this plea, he that is of God hears 
God's words. Now, that word hears doesn't even mean hear with an ear. It means follow. It means he that is of God follows or believes or acts upon God's word. So he that is of God hears, literally believes, and follows God's words. He said, therefore, you don't hear them because you're not of God. Why are they not of God? Well, he told us back in verse 44, because you're of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. So, Demetrius twists the truth, the people believe the lie. Now, you might wonder, how does this apply to 2020? Well, if you've ever listened to any news program, you can tell that there are so many lies from station to station. It's amazing to me how you can turn to one station and they'll say one thing and turn to another station and they take that same thing, but they twist it a different way. Why do people do that? Well, the answer is found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And so if you'll turn there with me, all the T's are together in the Bible. They're all about two-thirds of the way through your New Testament. So you, if you found Thessalonians, Timothy, and Titus, you've hit all the T's that are in the Bible. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Starting with verse 10, the Bible says now with all deceivableness. So there's some deceit involved, some lies. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness in those who are perishing. So obviously, the Apostle Paul is telling the church at Thessalonica that he's talking about people that aren't saved. People that don't know Jesus. And he says, of unrighteousness in those who are perishing because they would not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this reason, God will send them a strong delusion. Listen to me. When, when a person decides to reject God's truth, there's only one other way to go. The lie. You either believe the truth and you follow God, or you believe the lie and you follow Satan. And it's right here in Scripture. It says in verse 11, because they would not receive the love of the truth, God will send them a strong delusion and they will believe the lie so that they all might be damned who did not believe the truth, but rather they had pleasure in unrighteousness. So when people make a decision like, well, I don't care what God's word says, I'm going to abort this baby. What you're doing is you're signing up to receive a lie. Because God says if you won't receive the truth, he's going to send you a strong, trust me, if God sends you a strong delusion, you're going to be deluded. And you're going to believe the lie. So, in verses 29 through 41 of Acts chapter 19, the city of Ephesus is filled with confusion. The Bible tells us that. But God raises up a defense through the town clerk, and that's verses 29 through 41, the rest of the story. So Ephesus is filled with confusion, but God raises up a town clerk to defend the disciples. So let's take a look at that. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians 14. Now, if you believe the Bible, now I'm not saying if you have a Bible or if you think there's a God, because the devils even believe and tremble. I'm talking about, do you believe the Bible enough to follow the Bible? Do you believe Scripture enough? Let me give you an example. Do you believe the Bible teaches that we ought to gather together and have fellowship together? If you believe that, then you'll do that. If, do you believe that God wants us to give one another a holy hug? And that's in 1 Corinthians 16. God does want us to greet one another with a holy kiss, the Bible says. And that word kiss is hug or embrace. Okay? Do you believe that God wants us to sing worship songs? The scripture, all throughout scripture, but especially Psalm 150, is completely dedicated to worship. The whole psalm. The whole psalm is about worshiping the Lord. And then the Bible tells us in Ephesians and in other places, sing to one another in psalms and in hymns and in spiritual songs, making melody in your hearts to the Lord. Well, we've just been commanded by our government not to sing worship songs, not to gather together, not to give one another a holy hug, 
not even to give a handshake. In fact, not only are you to not fellowship, but you're to stay six feet apart from one another. I find that interesting because I'm one who will not walk in darkness. And think about this. Jesus said, if you walk in the light, as he is in the light, you'll have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from all sin. So when you're commanded to do something that's against God's commands, who are you going to choose? Are you going to choose to obey men? Or are you going to choose to obey God? Well, I take my example from Scripture. Peter and John said, we ought to obey God rather than men. And the Apostle Paul obviously obeyed God before he obeyed men. And I know uh, there are times when we have to obey, but not when it's against the Lord. Not when it's against the Lord. So, 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 33 tells us, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. So, here was Ephesus in total confusion. And God says, well, I'm not the author of that. So if God isn't the author of confusion, who is? You know, I talk to people all the time. They're so confused. They go to one store, they have to wear a mask. They go to another store, and there's no mask. Some stores, there's distancing. Other places like Walmart, you can't help but bump into people. It's insanity, and it's confusion. And God is not the author of confusion, but of peace is in all the churches of the saints. So who is the author of confusion? Well, obviously Satan. Satan's the author of confusion. So in James chapter 3, if you'll turn there with me, James would be right after the book of Hebrews, about almost all the way through the New Testament. James chapter 3, and starting with verse 14. Now the scripture tells us if we have bitter envying and strife in our hearts, we are not to glory and lie against the truth. Because this wisdom, and remember the people in Ephesus were all in an uproar against Paul preaching the truth. I wonder if there's anyone in our society who's in an uproar about churches. I wonder if there's anyone in our society that hates the gathering of Christian believers together. The Bible says in verse 15, this wisdom does not descend from above. It is rather earthly, sensual, and devilish. For where there is envying and strife, there is confusion and every evil work. Every evil work. I find it interesting, there was... Uh, by one of our uh, legislators, there was a, a text put out the other day, and it said, we are so thankful in Santa Barbara County for we believe that now that they're not counting the inmates from Lompoc Prison as COVID-19 infected people, we can meet the standards for opening some things in Santa Barbara County. And then he went on to list those things. And it was pet stores, porn shops, tanning booths, all kinds of businesses. Where were the churches? Not there. It's unbelievable nowadays. We have porn shops, marijuana stores, liquor stores, pet shops. So you're trying to tell me that even snakes, rats, cats, and dogs are more important than human beings fellowshipping with the living God? Is that what you're telling me? Think about it. And you say, well, why are you talking about these things? We're talking about Acts chapter 19 and the confusion. I know. We have to bring things from Scripture to our modern day to help us understand. And the people in Ephesus were in total confusion. If you'll remember, they were screaming out by the space of two hours, Great is the goddess of Diana. Great is the goddess of Diana. For two hours. We can barely stand one hour of a church service in America. Can you imagine screaming for two hours, great is the goddess of Diana? The whole city was in confusion. Why? Because God's not the author of confusion. Who was running that show? Obviously the devil. 
verses 30 and 31, Paul wanted to go into that assembly. And I know from studying the Apostle Paul, he wanted to go in, because Paul was a man of compassion, he wanted to go in and straighten out their thinking, talk to them and reason with them, and help them to understand why they were preaching Christ and the cross. The Bible says that Paul wanted to go into the assembly, but he was stopped by the disciples and another friend. Why? Well, let's take a look at Matthew chapter 10, the book of Matthew chapter 10. You know, church, there's a time to move and there's a time to stay still. And in Matthew, the 10th chapter, verse 16, Jesus said, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Now, I don't know why we are so surprised at this attack on the church of Jesus Christ in America. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 19, we know that we're of God, brethren, but the whole world lies in wickedness. And Jesus said, I will send you forth like sheep in the midst of wolves. Well, when I was a little boy in Utah, my grandpa had a sheep ranch, and I know exactly what that's like. Sheep in the midst of wolves, sheep don't win. The wolves win. And so here he says, I'm sending you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be wise, therefore, as serpents, as serpents and harmless as doves. In other words, the word harmless means innocent. Be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Verse 17, you are to beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And then look at 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. Why does this happen, you might ask? Well, in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, the Bible says, you are to be sober. You're to be vigilant. Because your adversary, what? We have an adversary? Yes, we're in a war. Light against darkness. Evil against good. Satan against Christ. We're in a war. The Bible says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, is walking about, seeking whom he may devour. So then in uh, verse 32, it's the enemy, it's the devil that causes the people to riot, and they don't even understand why they're rioting. So you can really discern what a gathering's all about by the fruit of the gathering. Where there's confusion and violence and all of those things, we know it's not of God. We know it's of the devil. Whereas there's praise and worship and glory given to God, we know that God is leading that assembly. Look at John chapter 10, if you would, with me. John chapter 10 and verse 10. Most of you know this, this uh, scripture by heart. John, the 10th chapter and verse 10. Now the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So let, let me see here. To steal. Any freedoms been stolen lately, church? First Amendment still being, uh, we're still free to have the First Amendment, freedom of speech, freedom to gather and worship. How about kill? Well, I know from studying several well-renowned, world-renowned biologists and scientists, they're saying the worst thing for people to do is to isolate themselves. There's something called herd immunity. And when people gather themselves together, there is a herd immunity that happens. When people separate, it kills their immune system. And that's exactly what's happening. Stealing, killing, and destroying. That's what the thief does, and the thief is referred to here as Satan. So what does God do? Well, he says, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. So, you know, you can't reason with people who are in darkness. Murder is murder. And when you try to tell them, look, your father promotes stealing, killing, and destroying. So can you easily see that killing a baby is murder? Nope. That's my right. I have a right. 
And I heard, I heard one preacher, a very wise man of God, say, look, it may be your right to do what you want to do with your body because you don't have God as your Savior, but you don't have any right to hurt the body that's inside of you, that God placed inside of you. In verses 33 and 34, Alexander is shouted down by the angry crowd when he attempts to make a defense to the assembly. So let's take a look at that. He tries, he attempts to stop the confusion. He attempts to stop this crowd from yelling, great is the goddess of Diana of the Ephesians. He tries to stop them because he knows he's the town clerk and he knows in his heart if this doesn't stop, they're all going to be called into account for this, for this rioting and this, this unsettling, uh, unsettling uh, riot that happened in the city. So let's take a look at Proverbs. We're going to look in the, the book of Proverbs. That's right in the middle of your Bible. Proverbs chapter 15, the book of wisdom. If you want to be soothed and you want to be comforted, read the book of Psalms. If you want to get wisdom, read the book of Proverbs. So in Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 1, the Bible says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Let me give you an example of grievous words. I just heard from someone that they watched a news program that said they even have a right now to go into a family and take family members out of their home if they're infected and quarantine them someplace else. So can you imagine Americans allowing someone to come in their home, take their elderly grandfather or their children or their wife, and pull them out of the house and take them to some un other unknown place? It's unbelievable what's happening in our country. America, it's time to wake up. It's time to repent of your greed and worshiping money and all of your pleasures. It is time to repent and turn to the living God. And this is what Alexander is trying to do. Look at Proverbs 15 and verse 18. He says, A wrathful man stirs up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeases strife. And this is what uh, Alexander was trying to do. Turn the page, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs 16 and verse 32. The scripture says, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and the one who rules his spirit is better than he who takes a city. And then Proverbs 27, 10 chapters ahead there. Proverbs 27 and verse 4. Wrath is cruel. Anger is outrageous. But who is able to stand before envy? I heard a bishop from Texas say this week on a Zoom meeting that, folks, don't be surprised that the world hates the church. You shouldn't be surprised at that. The Bible tells us the whole world lies in wickedness. Again, 1 John 5, 19. He said, it's not just that the world hates the church. It's that the world knows that the church is in the way of its globalistic future that they want to plan, the one world government. The church is in the way of that. So they want to get the church out of the way so that they can push forth their one world agenda with chips that can monitor where you go, where you don't go. It's all described in Revelation chapter 13, the mark of the beast. It's all right there. You say, well, you know, I think you're jumping the gun. No, I'm not. Read the Bible. If you read the Bible, you'll understand everything that's happening right now. This is setting the stage for the Antichrist. He's not here yet, or if he is, he hasn't revealed himself. But, but trust me, they have an agenda. Even Pope Francis has an agenda called 2030. And his agenda is by 2030, the whole world will be under one economic plan, one economic government, one climate change controlled government that will rule everyone. It's insane. It's also very biblical. So in the book of Ecclesiastes, if you'll continue to turn to your right, past Proverbs, you'll get to the book of Ecclesiastes, and if you'll turn to chapter 7, Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 9. 
Don't be hasty in your spirit to be angry, because anger rests in the bosom of fools. So we've, we've had five or six verses here that tell us to be careful about our anger. So is anger a bad thing? Well, I believe Jesus was angry when he went into the temple and made a whip and whipped the people out, kicked over tables, and let all the animals go because they were turning his father's house into a den of thieves. So there was anger there. When Jesus confronted the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23, he called them vipers, snakes, dead men tombs, and full of dead men's bones. And I believe there was anger with those statements as well. I do believe there's a time for peace and there's a time for war. And I believe that the Church of, of America, and really the church in the world, but especially America, has been under attack. And I, I'm shocked and amazed that there isn't more outrage at all of our God-given rights that have been taken away, let alone our constitutional rights that have been taken away. What, where's the outrage? Where are the people standing up like Peter and John and Paul and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and Daniel and Moses and all the others in Scripture who stood up? Remember little David? I'm going to be preaching on that this Sunday, and you can catch my sermon sometime Sunday afternoon when it's on YouTube. But I'm preaching on David and Goliath. And when little David, the sheep herder, uh, he was an adolescent at the time, came to the place where the battle was, Israel's army was shaking in their boots. And there was a nine foot six inch giant named Goliath who was standing in the valley challenging the entire Israeli army to come and fight with him. And they were all shaking in their boots. And God used a little adolescent boy to take that giant down. And that's just like God. So in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 9, the Bible says, Anger rests in the bosom of fools. Jesus said, be angry, but don't sin in your anger. So I believe there should be anger, but our anger should be controlled enough to make a change in what's happening. Verses 35 through 41, God calms the angry crowd by sending the town clerk. So this town clerk comes in and tells them, what is the meaning of this assembly? What is the meaning of all this uproar? Why have you people been crying for two hours? Great is the goddess of Diana of the Ephesians. What's this about? And back up in, in, the, in, in the story, the scripture says they didn't even know why they were gathering. They were just upset and they were having a riot. And there wasn't even really any reason of any of them being there other than they ex accepted the lie from Demetrius. So God calms the angry crowd by sending the town clerk. So let's take a look. You're in Ecclesiastes. Turn back to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 29. So you'll go back to the left, middle of your Bible, the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 29, verses 8 and 9. So let's, let's find out who God says causes confusion and who God says causes snares for people. Amen? So the Bible says, scornful men bring a city into a snare. Let's take, for instance, modern day Los Angeles. Complete lockdown right now. Complete lockdown. There's no scientific sense to any of it, but it's under complete lockdown. And from what I understand, it's going to be in complete lockdown, possibly through the entire summer maybe even through the whole month of August. So with 30 million plus people out of work in America right now, who brings a city into a snare? Proverbs 29.8. Scornful men. Wise men turn away wrath. Verse 9. If a wise man contends with a foolish man, whether he rages or laughs, there is no rest. I know there's some people I've talked to that are very uh, confused. They're very upset. They're very frustrated because they're trying to talk with their friends and talk some sense into them about what's really going on. And there's no rest. It says, 
if a wise man argues or contends with a foolish man, whether he rages or whether he laughs, there's no rest. Why? Because they believed the lie that they all might be damned because they had pleasure in unrighteousness and would not receive the truth. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. So in Proverbs chapter 11, so you're going to have to turn to your left again, back to Proverbs chapter 11, starting with verse 10. Proverbs 11 and verse 10. The Bible says, when it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices. How much rejoicing have you seen lately? Seen a lot of rejoicing around? People happy? People having a good time? When it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices. And when the wicked perish, there is shouting. By the blessing of the upright, a city is lifted up or exalted. But it is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. That's what the scripture says. And then t take a look here at Proverbs 16. And let's start with verse 30. Actually, verse 29. Let's start with verse 27. I think would be more appropriate. Proverbs 16, 27. An ungodly man digs up evil. In his lips there is a burning fire. Sounds like Demetrius. Stirred up the whole city of Ephesus. They were in an uproar for two hours, screaming, Great is the goddess Diana of the Ephesians. And then when they were called into question, they didn't even know why they were upset. So an ungodly man digs up evil, and in his lips there's a burning fire. A froward man sows strife, and a whisperer separates best friends. A violent man entices his neighbor and leads him in the way that isn't good. He shuts his eyes to devise froward things. Moving his lips, he brings evil to pass. And then verse 31, the Gray hair, or the hoary head, is a crown of glory, if it is found in the way of righteousness. If it's not found in the way of righteousness, it's not a crown of glory, it's a crown of shame. Verse 32, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that rules his spirit is better than he that takes a city. Even though the lot is cast into the lap, the whole disposing of it is of the Lord. So what am I trying to say here? Turn with me to the book of Habakkuk as we close. We get this example from Demetrius who stirs up people, causes him to believe a lie. The whole city goes into confusion. And finally, the town clerk has to come and calm him down before the authorities call them all into question about what this uproar is really about. So if you'll turn with me to Habakkuk, the book of Habakkuk, and we're going to go to chapter 1, Habakkuk chapter 1. You have the prophet of God here who's crying out, why does God permit wickedness to continue in Judah? And why is God using wicked people to punish uh, those who are righteous? And God responds by assuring Habakkuk that what he has seen and what he has chosen to do is right, and that the faith of the people will be rewarded. And I believe, church, our faith is going to be rewarded. Let me encourage you, you can only walk in one thing. You can't walk in fear and claim that you have faith. You're either going to have faith and no fear, or you're going to have fear and no faith. You can't have both. You can't mix oil and water. You can't mix light and darkness. If you turn on the light, the darkness runs away. If you turn off the light, the darkness comes in. You can't mix fear and faith. You're either going to walk in fear or you're going to walk in faith. So Habakkuk starts out in verse 1 and says, The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. O Lord, how long will I cry and you will not hear? Even I cry out unto you of violence, and you will not save. 
Verse 3, why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see grievance? There's spoiling and violence before me, and there are those who raise up strife and contention. Therefore, the law has slackened. Yeah, you know what? I think the law has slackened when people are put in hotel rooms at the expense of the taxpayer and, and drugs and alcohol are bought for them just to keep them quiet and happy. The law is slacked and judgment never goes forth. The wicked surrounds the righteous and therefore wrong judgment proceeds. So Habakkuk's got a pretty good claim here on what's happening in the land. He complains to God, but God says this, and I want to encourage you, church. I believe God is saying this in our day and in our time to us. Behold, you among the heathen, regard and wonder marvelously. God says, I will work a work in your days, which you will not believe, even if it were told to you. So I believe we serve a mighty God who is on the move. I believe God is... In my opinion, and from what I observe, I believe God is setting a trap for the wicked. The Bible says, He that rolls a stone, it will fall upon his head. And he who digs a pit will fall in his own pit. It's kind of like the story in Esther, where Haman just wanted to take out Mordecai. He built some gallows and wanted to hang him. And Haman ended up being hung on his own gallows. And I believe the same thing's happening in our land. It may not look like that now. But God says, behold, I'm going to work a work in your day that you won't even believe. Even if I told you what I'm going to do, you won't believe it. So I believe that we walk in faith. We believe that our God is an awesome God. Our God is a righteous God. He's a God full of justice. And our God will rule supreme. So let's pray tonight and ask the Lord to do just that. Would you agree with me in faith? Father, we thank you for this story about the church of Ephesus and how Paul preached and many were saved. And then Demetrius rose up and began to tell lies and cause a complaint against the church and against Paul. In fact, he stirred up the whole city into an uproar for two hours and you raised up, even in that midst of that confusion, even in the midst of all that rage, you raised up a town clerk to rebuke the people and tell them to disperse before they were called into question for why they were there. So, Father, I know you can do that in our day, and we do ask that, Father. We don't care who you raise up. We just know that you'll raise up warriors. Whether it be angels or men, you're raising up warriors even now that we will have the victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So, Father, we give you praise and we give you thanks. You know, Lord, you tell us that faith is the substance of things hoped for, and it's the evidence of things we don't even yet see. And so we walk in faith believing we have the victory in Jesus Christ, our Lord. We thank you and we praise you for tonight's study. Thank you for encouraging us, Father. And bless us now, the Church of Jesus Christ, in America and throughout the world, bless us, for we know we have the victory through Christ our Lord. For we pray it in His name. Amen. Amen, and God bless you. Thank you for joining us tonight. And we'll be back again Sunday morning, uh, preaching on David and Goliath. God bless you, and good evening.